Good afternoon. This is Scott Reich, and we are here for another edition of Voir Dire, Legal Talk Edition. Today, we want to talk about, once again, the Chris Watts case currently pending in Weld County, Colorado. Um, and those who are not familiar with this matter, we've been following it. It's the uh, case of Christopher Watts, who is alleged to have killed his wife, Shanann, uh, who was pregnant, and then his two small children. The case is currently pending up in uh, Weld County, as I mentioned, and there's been some activity in the case. And haven't heard about this on the news or anything like that, but frankly, I just don't think they're following it that closely, and I don't think they really understand what some of this information may mean, and that's why I'm here to hopefully try and give some analysis to that, uh, simply beyond the... Uh, news clip that you're going to hear on the evening news. And what I want to talk about is that um, late last week, the defense for Mr. Watts filed a motion, uh, and it's a, it's a motion titled Mr. Watts Motion for Leave to File a Pleading Under Seal Pursuant to Administrative Order 2016-4 and further request to hold an ex parte hearing on the issue. So, First of all, anything that gets filed in a criminal matter is going to be a matter of public record. And if the defense were to file this, obviously we would all have a copy of it, just like we are able to obtain a copy of what I'm holding before me. And so they're asking that this be filed under seal, and only the people uh, that would have access to it would be basically the uh, court, his staff, and the defense attorneys. The significance of that is, is that obviously they, they being Mr. Watts' attorneys, don't want the prosecution to know about it. Additionally, they want an ex parte hearing. An ex parte hearing would be only the defense would be available uh, at the hearing and not the prosecution. And obviously that is uh, going to take something of great significance or usually involves some sort of issue regarding you know, attorney-client um, communications or something along those lines. And so the reason why I think this motion is interesting, I'm curious to see what it holds, is that uh, basically uh, they uh, state in their motion that uh, Mr. Watts is concerned that the uh, court may order the pleading be unsealed, and if it does, believe the information in the filing is protected by federal law. Specifically, they're referring to the... HIPAA laws. Um, and so they're worried about disclosure. And I pulled the uh, HIPAA law that is applicable here under 42 U.S. Code Section 1320D-6, which is wrongful disclosure of individually identifiable health information. And it specifically states uh, it's an offense for a person who knowingly and in violation of this part, uses or causes to be used a unique health identifier, obtains individually identifiable health information relating to an individual, or discloses individually identifiable health information to another person. And then it says that it shall, that person shall be punished in subsection B of this section. For the purpose of the previous sentence, a person, including an employee or another individual, shall be considered to have to have obtained or disclosed individually identifiable health information in violation of this part if this information is maintained by a covered entity as defined in the HIPAA privacy regulations. So we're talking about HIPAA information here. And obviously the uh, defense attorneys are concerned that they have something and they don't want to disclose it because they it appears that they could be fined up to one year in jail or a $50,000 fine. So then the information then becomes, what does the defense possibly have? And the reason why that's significant here is the defense has filed uh, a couple of cases. They've, they've cited a couple of uh, cases in support of their proposition for this ex parte holding and as basically deciding what they should do with this information. And they cited the case of People v. Cisneros at 55 P. 3rd, 797, and that's a Colorado Supreme Court. And it holds in that particular case, the court uh, ruled that the government in that particular case had called a witness in a case. It was a um, sexual assault case, and this therapy helped refresh the person's recollection and 
the therapist testified as to what was recollect or the victim testified as to what they did they talked about in the psychological psychologist's uh, uh, meeting and the court determined that that was not a basis to uh, waive attorney client privilege which I have a real problem with this. I've litigated this case recently. Um, very similar type situations. Somebody comes in, they have no memory of something. They meet with the uh, psychologist. They go through some uh, therapy. And next thing you know, everything just happens to come back to them or it comes in bits and pieces. And then ultimately the question is, who put this in their mind? How did they remember it? Uh, suggestibility, did it come to me in a dream? So I've got a real problem with that. But it helps give some indication of what they are holding, what the defense is holding, and they're not sure what the hell to do with it. And the other case that they cite is WESP, W-E-S-P versus Emerson, Everson. And in that particular case, um, uh, Miss WESP was the uh, victim of a sexual assault. Her stepfather had sexually assaulted her, was accused of it, and apparently he committed suicide. And Basically, the father's estate was uh, maintained the same attorney to uh, handle the estate and wrap things up and handle the claims against against um, uh, the stepfather. And the issue there was basically revealing privileged communications uh, that were obtained during these these conversations. Apparently, the father, the mother, and and some other people were present during. Uh, some conversations, and the question then becomes, is was the attorney-client privilege waived? And when does this attorney-client privilege continue? And obviously, understand the attorney-client privilege is one of the privileges that is uh, sacrosanct in the legal system. You cannot go violating the attorney-client privilege unless you basically have a court order or your client has done something that waives uh, attorney-client privilege because w attorneys in the legal system want uh, people accused of crime or even engaging in uh, non-criminal activity of business. It's your business lawyer or your tort lawyer. You want the client to be able to feel confident that uh, what you tell them is the truth so that you can get the best legal advice and rep representation that exists. Now, obviously, you know, if somebody comes to me and they tell me, um, you know, uh, I've killed 10 people and here's the location of the bodies. Well, guess what? I can never tell anybody um, that information. And uh, the only way I could be forced to reveal some sort of communication in that regard is if somebody were to come to me and say actively, here's my information uh, that I'm going to go, you know, commit a homicide and, and this is what I'm going to do. If I have a a real belief that a th true threat was going to take place and that someone's going to go do that right now, then I would have to, I would have to do that. But if they come to me after the incident and they tell me all the terrible things that they have done, I cannot tell anyone that unless the client agrees. And so what I'm speculating, and there's some speculation, but based upon the cases that the uh, defense has cited, they filed this motion, and then late Friday, the court granted an order, I guess, yeah, 20 seconds, it basically said, go ahead and file uh, this information under seal, and the court said that he will then determine whether it needs to be suppressed or whether it should be made available for public viewing. And basically, the court says, I don't even know what you have, but out of an abundance of caution, I'm going to let you file it, and then we'll decide what we need to do. Uh, so it's... I haven't seen anything about any hearings being set. The information should have been turned over to the court, although I didn't see any submission receipt in the filings either. But we'll be following that because I think the defense has something. I believe the defense has some type of medical record that belongs to either the children or Sh Shanann. Uh, that they either obtained through the course of their investigation or somebody gave to them. And then the question is, who gave it, under what circumstances, and is there a waiver? Because some of the, the uh, cases that they cite to basically says that the, uh, in fact, they, they cite to it, here's the Everson case, it says, noting that attorneys may not disclose attorney-client privilege information even after the privilege holder has died. 
So, once again, nobody really knows what this means. The court indicated they didn't know what it means. I'm not exactly sure what it means, but I think it's worthy of some type of discussion simply for the fact that the attorneys are seeking guidance from the court as to what they can do with this document. And it sounds like it's obviously protected under HIPAA. So it sounds like it possibly is medically related. There may be, I don't know if she was seeking, you know, obviously medical care. We know that uh, Shanann had lupus. Uh, You know, the case also that they cited in that particular case, there was a suicide note. And so uh, they were fighting over, they wanted the note. So it's very curious to see what the defense has obtained and how they obtained it. If it was randomly mailed to them or if they came across it or if it was in files that uh, you know the family came across when they were cleaning out the house. Who knows? But it's going to be interesting, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Please, if you like what you uh, see, go ahead and subscribe hit the like button and hit that little bell and you'll be notified of the next time that we post something. Uh, you can download the podcast at uh, Voir Dire. It is on uh, iTunes. It's on a bunch of other sites. You can also watch us on YouTube at scottreich.com and we appreciate it. And let us know what you think. Obviously, this Chris Watts case is taking an interesting turn. It's going to get really exciting here real soon because they're going to be setting a preliminary hearing. We're going to see what kind of documents, if any, we'll find out as to what was turned over to the court to view and decide whether they need to have a hearing on it, who possesses the privilege. Uh, I mean, it's that's exciting stuff. That's exciting legal stuff uh, because it's it sucks when you have really great information as a defense attorney and you can't use it or you know it's there, but you can't get to it. And so it's going to be good. It's going to be good. So if you like it, subscribe. If you uh, want to leave a comment, let me know what you want to talk about on this uh, Christopher Watts case or if there's another case out there that is of great interest to you, please let me know. We can talk about it. Obviously, it seems like the world is just absolutely going crazy. We've got people mailing bombs. We have people shooting up synagogues, and it's absolutely crazy what's going on in the world. So we'll be talking about it. We'll be talking about some interesting cases, and I've got a real interesting case coming up here soon that I'd like to talk about. It was a case is currently up on appeal, but I think it's just rather interesting, great issues, and uh, I think it'll be intriguing to a lot of people, maybe try to make that into some sort of a serial episode, uh, because I've got some great transcripts, and it's really an interesting story. So have a great day. Continue to watch. And we'll be following the Watts case and providing in-depth legal analysis because, frankly, no one else is doing it. Have a great day.